means to either conform, comply, or act in accordance with. To literally imitate or to copy. So then why do we think when Jesus said, follow me, he meant raise a hand, sign a card, or show up at church once a week? When Jesus said, follow me, he wanted people who imitated him, who conformed to him, who looked like him. He wanted us to drop everything, radically change our lives, and yield to the unknown. He wanted us to follow, to go where he goes, to do what he does, because he is bringing his kingdom, and the only thing he asks is, will we follow? Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this wonderful, dreary Sunday morning? Are we ready for snow? Tamil talks about Christmas. I have this kind of love-hate for Christmas. I like the Christmas season, but I hate the weather that it brings. Uh, And so Christmas in California would be fine with me. Uh, For those that are visiting, uh, I'm Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege that I'm going to be able to share uh, scripture with you this morning. And we've been working through uh, over the past five weeks on building a definition of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We've, we've explored what Jesus means when he calls us to follow him. I should probably start my timer <laughs> for your sake. So here's our definition so far. A Christian is one who follows Jesus by devoting his or her life to the kingdom vision of God, to a life of loving God and loving others, and to a society shaped by justice, especially for those who have been marginalized, and to peace. And so this is the definition that we've been building of what scripture says following Jesus actually looks like. What does the Christian life, uh, what does scripture call us as Christians to Uh, to look like? How do we go about living? And when Jesus calls us to follow, it literally means that we are to walk with him, that we are called to become like him, that we are called to live in the presence of his kingdom. This kingdom vision of love, justice, and peace shapes what following Jesus looks like, not just for us, but what it looks like to people in our world around us. And it shapes how we interact and how we experience Jesus in our lives as his followers. This is the life that we are called to strive for as disciples of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're continuing to add to our definition of what a disciple is. Not only are we called to the kingdom vision of love, justice, and peace, we're also called to wisdom. But, but what does the Bible mean when it talks about wisdom? I feel like we have a skewed view of what wisdom is, and we struggle to, uh, to figure out the difference between uh, human wisdom, worldly wisdom, and biblical wisdom. So what does the Bible actually say when we talk about wisdom? How does the Bible see wisdom differently than the world does? It's really important that we know the difference between a worldly view of wisdom and a biblical view of wisdom. And I fear... Uh, I don't even fear it. I know it. It's our reality. We actually have shaped our discipleship around a worldly view of wisdom, not around a biblical view. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit uh, to qualify it today. Anybody use the Webster Dictionary? Anybody actually have a physical copy of a Webster Dictionary or do you just Google it? There's a few here. Good for you. Well, I Googled it. And the Webster Dictionary, when you look up wisdom, has some interesting things attached to it. So initially, it defines wisdom as the ability to have or make good judgment, a wise decision. But then listen to this, 
what it had attached to it. The accumulated philosophical, sorry, accumulated philosophical or scientific learning. 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 You've got to learn in order to be wise. In other words, wisdom and knowledge in the world are linked together. Knowledge and wisdom go hand in hand. We gain knowledge, which then makes us wise. This knowledge and wisdom helps one to make good judgments in a learned area. Often, wisdom is linked to experience or to age, because we think that when we age, we gain experience. Someone who has experienced something more than another person would be considered to be wiser than the inexperienced person. That makes sense, doesn't it? We, we tend to get our wise counsel from someone who knows more about a subject than we do, or from someone who has more experience in a said subject more than we do. Like, for instance, if we're seeking medical advice, generally speaking, we would go to a... Thank you for not saying Google. <laughs> and if we were seeking legal advice, we would generally go to a lawyer. We connect learned knowledge with wisdom. And we seek people out that we see as wise people. So if you go to a new doctor who's like fresh out of school uh, and you're, you're like, can you send in the real doctor? You know, the one with some experience? Or when you go to the new lawyer, can, you're like, can you send in the real lawyer, like the one with experience? Because this is a big deal to me and I don't want a rookie. We automatically in our world connect wisdom with age and our learned experiences. That's a worldly view of wisdom. Now, I would actually argue, too, that in our day and age, the whole concept of learning and wisdom is really drastically changed. And I say that because I, I really believe that people don't go to the doctor, they go to Google. People don't go to the lawyers, they go to Google. I think even some of you have attempted to gain wisdom through Facebook <laughs> or Instagram or Twitter. We used to go to people that were the people who gained the knowledge and the wisdom, but now everyone has an opinion, and so we hear from many voices. In today's world, there's a lot of people who claim to be wise about certain subjects. People tweet and post their opinions all the time about things. Have you ever been on Google analyzing something medical about the cough that you have? Where all of a sudden you become the general practitioner and then you go into the doctor and say, I think I have this. See, we're gaining wisdom from places where we've never gained wisdom before. And in a worldly view of wisdom, seeing it as learned, you can go on the internet and learn all kinds of things, but often it's just opinions. And nowadays, opinions are beginning to shape our wisdom. The book of Isaiah, God has a profound reminder that is a sound that should sound warning bells for the church today. And I believe that this is a warning to all generations that are present in this room and any generation that is alive and past generations. This isn't like, don't sit there when I read this and say, yeah, those young people, or yeah, this person or that person. I think that that God is saying this in a timely way in Isaiah's moment, and it's carried on throughout generations. Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than yours. Hmm. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Our ways are not God's ways. God's thoughts are higher than ours. When it, when it comes to how Christians shape their wisdom, 
This passage reminds us how we are to see wisdom differently than the world. The world shapes wisdom by learning about something than gaining experience in what we have learned. Essentially, to the world, the beginning of wisdom is knowledge. Unfortunately, this is exactly how we've shaped our Christian discipleship. So someone professes Christ as their Lord and Savior. They say the sinner's prayer. They get saved. They're now saved from from sin. They're saved from God's wrath. They're going to go to heaven. They have this future hope one day. It's awesome. And then they, they're like, okay, so now like, I, I need to become a disciple. Because not everybody that professes Christ, I would say, actually becomes a disciple. But we'll talk about that another day. We've kind of been talking about it for five weeks. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> we say, I got to learn. I got I to gotta open this up and I got to learn more about God. I have to gain knowledge about God. Memorize things about the Bible. Read books about the Bible that contain other people's opinions. I I love it. Sometimes I'll see on Facebook, right? It's going to spend some time with Jesus and you have like a, a, a book of some author, right? And it's not my book. And anyway. Right? Like we, we often in our Christian discipleship, go to the Christian living section of the Christian bookstore, or in our case now, Amazon, and we look to see what other people are saying about the Bible. And I think the reason for that is is because the Bible has become dry to us, uh, and, and then it's just not alive. It's just not real. But we think that we need to get educated in the Bible, educated on a subject, and then we need to begin to do like a research paper on it and research what other people have to say about it. And then we find an author or someone who we like their theology and we start to shape what we believe about God and how we behave with God around that specific person. And we even, like we ignore the people who think differently than us and we focus in on the people who think like us and we quote them and we say, See, this person says this, so that must be what the Bible says. And it's all about gaining knowledge. We look to someone who's educated in a subject who offers the same opinion as us, and then we quote them to say that's that's what it says. I get so frustrated when people tell me that they believe something simply because it's something they've always been taught. I hear it all the time. Why do you believe that about God? Well, that's what I've always been taught. (laughs) Okay. God gave us the ability to connect with him through Jesus. And this means that we're able to know him at a deeper level. We won't fully know him, but we're able to dig deeper into him. It means that what that we should look into what we believe and not just default to believing what someone else teaches. I don't want you to take my word for it as the teacher. I'm actually begging you to read it for yourself. You can use things that I've taught to guide you, but ultimately, folks, Jesus gave you a mind and the ability to hear from his spirit. There's the key piece. He gave you a mind that can stray and take you in places that we shouldn't be, but his spirit centers you in on where God wants to take you. If you just take my word for it, I'm not actually sure you're ever truly connecting with what you think you believe. I'm going to say that again. If you take my word for it, I'm not sure you're actually truly connecting with what you believe. God calls us to a different kind of wisdom than the world. Biblical wisdom is different than worldly learning and it has absolutely nothing to do with age. You can be older or younger and be wise or not wise when the Bible talks about wisdom. 
Biblical wisdom, it's just totally different than the way of worldly wisdom because God thinks differently than we do. And biblical wisdom, folks, is learning to think the way that God does. Biblical wisdom is learning to think the way God does. Whenever a Hebrew person would speak of wisdom, they meant more than just simple intellect. Hebrew wisdom consists of intellect, that's part of it, but it's not simply book knowledge, textbook knowledge. Wisdom is practical, moral, and religious to the Hebrew people. And it begins with God and our view of God. The book of Proverbs gives us direct instructions on how to gain wisdom. It's called the wisdom book, right? And so Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, so we're not done there, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I really think we have a serious problem in the church. I really do. And it isn't that we don't have enough potlucks and social events. It isn't that we don't vote properly or our structure isn't right. I think we have a serious, serious problem in the church. And I think it's been a serious, serious problem in the church for an awful long time. And I actually think it's exactly why the church has become less and less relevant in a broken world. In our culture today. No one fears God anymore. No one fears God anymore. We lack the fear of the Lord, but we also lack a biblical understanding of fear. Because it's interesting because often people will, will say that fear is like, I'm scared of God because I need to be saved from God's wrath. God actually kind of hates me and Jesus stands in the way. Like you see this in tracks all the time, right? And we define that. I fear the Lord because I fear hell. The problem is, folks, is that isn't what Scripture is talking about at all. When it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When Scripture talks of fearing God, it's not talking about fearing his wrath or his judgment. Fearing God means something more, so much more life-changing than that. In this passage in Proverbs, the word interpreted as fear of the Lord actually means awe and reverence. Let me give you a, a good example of what that practically looks like in our life. If you were to walk up to the Grand Canyon... Has anybody seen the Grand Canyon? Anybody been? There's a few of you, but not many. Okay, it's big, and it's a big deal. Imagine if you were standing right at the edge, like your toes hanging over the edge of the Grand Canyon. This is the awe and the reverence that the Bible describes as the fear of, of the Lord. Because you, you look out at the vastness and the, just how huge this Grand Canyon is and how amazing and how beautiful it is. And you look down and you're like, whoa! Like one more step further and it's over, right? When the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, the Bible is talking About awe. Being in awe of the Lord. It's the kind of reverent awe that transforms ordinary lives into wisdom life. Being scared of God doesn't transform, but awe does. Awe is what changes the way that we think. 
It's being in awe of God that drives us to want more, to experience more, to know more about what awes us. Have you ever been completely taken with something? Like something that completely infatuates you? you know, maybe it was a girl. Something that you were just in awe over. And it begins to drive the way you think. It begins to drive the way you act. See, the Bible says that's exactly how you should be with God. In complete awe of him. And that awe drives you to want more, to experience more, and to know more about what drives your awe. When I am completely captured by who God is, I can't sing words on a screen without the awe starting to come out because of the words that I'm singing. This is, this is why I struggle uh, with, with the church. It often, And I'm not talking about charismatic expressions. I don't care about that. But when we sing a song and we have the awe of God in us, we fear God, we can't help but go, wow! Like, this is the God that has saved me. This is who I'm singing to. This is who I'm praising. This is who I'm giving worship to. But instead, our posture is like, how great is our God. I'm not convinced that you're fearing God. Because if I sing how great is our God and I have the fear of the Lord in me, I can't help but well up and just go, wow. I'm standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon and I'm going, wow. The church lacks awe. The church doesn't fear the Lord anymore. Our awe for God Scripture says, is the beginning of wisdom in our lives. When we lack awe and wonder in our relationship with Jesus, we lack wisdom. We are not able to see things the way that God does. I'm going to say it again. When we lack awe and wonder, he says the fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we lack awe, if we lack fear and wonder in our relationship with Jesus, we lack wisdom. We're not able to see things the way that God does. I actually think that this is why we struggle with God's kingdom vision of life here on earth. That his kingdom vision is shaped by love, justice, and peace. But people argue with me about that. They say, no, if you preach a loving gospel, that's fluffy. Except scripture says that, that it's that love for God and love for others that completely shapes the gospel and who we're called to be. That love and justice and peace are part of following Jesus. We lack awe and we lack genuine fear of God. We profess belief, but we don't live like we believe that God is our creator. That Jesus died so we could live, that we receive grace even when we don't deserve it. I truly believe that this is because we are not in awe of God. Instead, we just learn stuff about God and we never experience God. As a matter of fact, I know Christian traditions that are completely petrified of experiencing God. They just want to learn about him. When we experience God in a way that creates genuine awe, we begin to learn wisdom. Awe is the beginning, the starting point. The word used in the original text as we translate as wisdom in this passage could also be rendered as acting wisely or to act wisely. So this passage actually in the original text, now I'm working from a Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible because I don't know Hebrew, I only know Greek. And so I'm using the Septuagint to translate this. But I think it could be rendered as being in awe of God is the beginning of acting wisely. Being in awe of God is the beginning of acting wisely. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There it is again. 
right? The awe of God is the beginning of acting wisely. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Notice the psalmist here pressing into following his precepts. Having a good understanding of who God is and what he has called us to. This is what awe drives you toward. Knowing God more deeply through Jesus. Job. Some of you might have heard of him. In his book, chapter 28, verse 28, he says this. And he said to the human race, most of us here are humans. Most of us here are part of the human race. There might be a few exceptions, but most of us, I would guess, we're humans. So he's talking to us. He says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Now listen to what he says. And to shun evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Fearing God leads to wisdom, and the proof that you are growing in wisdom is the ability to shun evil. This is true understanding according to Job. In other words, true wisdom is when someone takes their knowledge about God and learns how to live it. But where does our knowledge of God come from? This is the dilemma in the Christian church. Where does the knowledge of God come from? Is it a, is it a tweet? Is it the latest speaker or the greatest author? Now, most people would say, no, 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 no. That, it all starts with the Bible, with reading our Bible. And my answer to that is, well, yes, kind of. Because if, if you're reading it with awe, absolutely. But if you read scripture without the Holy Spirit driven fear of God, then you'll probably approach it more like a textbook. Anybody here been to school and bought textbooks? I can show you in my office where my textbooks sit. Collecting dust on a shelf. I remember buying textbooks for like $200 and reading three pages. We don't interact well with textbooks, and so if we approach the Bible like it's a textbook, it will be dry, and frankly, like most textbooks, it will collect dust and never get read. Or if it does get read, it's for nappy time. You ever use the textbook for that? I've used journal articles for that. I have specific authors that I will go to because I know they will put me to sleep with a journal article. Journal article, it's like an academic article. Smart people write them, which is why I go to sleep. That being said, when scripture is alive, because you have this reverent awe of God, when scripture is alive, it speaks to you, and then you will learn about how God thinks. Biblical wisdom means we gain knowledge about God, but living knowledge, not textbook knowledge about who God is as revealed through the person of Jesus. This is why, folks, Jesus calls us to follow him rather than go home and study about God. Do you ever notice in the Gospels, Jesus is walking along a beach and he says, Hey, Peter, Andrew, follow me. He doesn't stop and say, Peter, Andrew, here's the latest copy of the scroll of the Hebrew scriptures. Read it. Have you ever noticed that? He doesn't send them home to study or to gain knowledge. What he calls them to is to walk with him, to follow him. Jesus says, if you want to know the Father, then follow me, because when you see me, you see the Father. The way we find true wisdom is by following Jesus. This means we have to know who he is and what he calls us to. And this can be found in the stories of scripture. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says as he describes his understanding of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. 
He says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I want you to notice small g. I'll explain that in a second. So they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. To Paul, the small g God that he's talking about, The small g God of this age is the demonic presence of sin in our lives. And it blinds our ability to be biblically wise. It stops us from being in awe of Jesus. To Paul, Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the light in the darkness. The one who shows us God's true nature, his true character. Jesus is the human image of God. And it's Jesus that shows us God's glory. And it's through the life of Jesus that we find knowledge of how God thinks. So when Jesus calls us to follow him, to live as he lived, to think how he thinks. I'm going to give you a big news flash, and I really want you to read this and look into it. He's not kidding. When Jesus says, follow me, come, walk with me, come, become like me, he is giving us sound instruction on how to take on the mind of Christ, to think like God, to grow in your awe and your wisdom. But when the demonic presence of sin in our lives blinds us, we struggle to be biblically wise. In other words, we struggle to discern God's will. And often that demonic presence of sin in our lives is our deep need to be in control of everything. Jesus isn't kidding. If you want to grow in wisdom, you're going to need to orient each day toward God. If you want to grow in wisdom, you're going to need to orient each day toward God. The fear of God, the awe of God, should be what begins your day, what ends your day, what saturates every moment between with a conscious living with God. Let me simplify that for you. God should consume your everything. Everything, not just in your devotional moment with my daily bread. God consumes your heart and your mind, your everything. He's the centerpiece of who you are, and it's what drives your awe. It's what drives you to live. We have to orient ourselves that way, pointing toward God, and the way to do that is to follow Jesus. Living before God is living with an awareness that someday we will give an account to God of what we have done and who we have been. Are you ready to stand before the Lord and say, this is what I made my priority? Me. Because that is most of our realities, is that our priority, what actually drives us in life, it's not the fear of God, it's not being in awe of God, it's what I need, it's me. And that is the presence of this demonic sin in our lives, and it blinds us from fearing the Lord, which blinds us from being wise. But you can have the entire Bible memorized and still not be wise. Because that's exactly how the Pharisees were. Their whole school system was about memorizing the Hebrew scriptures. Their kids had it memorized. And yet, who is the person that Jesus reprimands the most? The Pharisees. The ones with the knowledge and the claim of wisdom. 
Are you ready to give an account for what you have focused on in your life? So folks, the awe of God transforms ordinary life into wisdom life. So let's add to our definition. A Christian is one who follows Jesus by devoting his or her life to the kingdom vision of God, to a life of loving God and loving others, and to a society shaped by justice, especially for those who have been marginalized, to peace, and to a life devoted to growing in wisdom. That's biblical wisdom. Growing in awe of God. Fearing God. And the way to gain wisdom is to know Christ. To learn his ways and to be in awe of who Jesus is. When we think Jesus, we should have the picture of standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Reverent awe. Going, wow. Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior is calling me to follow him. A disciple of Jesus seeks first his kingdom and is marked by a life full of love, justice, peace, and wisdom. We're called to live a wise life, a life that learns to see the world as God sees it. Broken and in need of a savior. So let me just get really practical for you. Let me try to help you out with this. In everything you do, ask yourself, is this the wise thing to do? Now, I'm going to back up for a second. Not, is this the logical thing to do? That's worldly wisdom. Is this the thing that makes sense? Is this what the bank would approve? Right? That's human wisdom. That's human logic. That is not when we say, is this the wise thing to do? We are shaping that through the lens of love, justice, peace, and wisdom. In other words, is what I'm about to say or how I'm about to act a good representation of who Jesus is? Is it loving? Does it seek justice, offer hope and peace? Is it the wise thing to do? You see, if God is saturating your whole life, he saturates your workplace, He saturates your conversations with your kids. He saturates you in the Tim Hortons lineup. And if we're constantly asking, is that the wise thing to do? Am I representing Jesus in this moment that helps to shape our wisdom? It helps to create an awareness that maybe we're looking at wisdom in a worldly sense, just gaining knowledge, but not gaining a relationship with Jesus Christ. The band can join me up here. (coughs) Biblical wisdom is shaped by Jesus. Worldly wisdom is shaped by sin. Biblical wisdom is shaped by Jesus. Worldly wisdom is shaped by sin. Disciples are called to be shaped by Jesus so that they can shun sin. True wisdom is the ability to discern the will of Jesus. And folks, he actually doesn't want it to be super difficult. When we say the will of God, the will of Jesus, he didn't didn't create that to be like where we needed 50 books on how to find the will of God. God's will is that you follow Jesus. That you live a life of love, justice, and peace. That's the will of God. That you believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross. But he didn't just stay on the cross. He died like everyone else who claimed to be the Messiah. But three days later, he changed everything because he rose again, conquering death. And the human problem that we have is death. And the only one who could conquer it was Jesus Christ. Not us, not our knowledge. I haven't found a doctor yet that can reverse death. I've found doctors that can delay it, but I haven't found one that can reverse it. 
I only know one. And he calls us to follow him. He calls us to a life of wisdom. Will you stand?